It's great to see everybody um, trying really hard to work technology in this um, time. So thank you. All right, well, we'll anticipate that there'll be people who come in throughout the webinar. Um, so that should be fine. Uh, I've got Ash Rogers here just admitting them as they come in. So you'll just hear a little ding as they come in. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, there's people from across Victoria, um, which is really nice. That's one of the benefits of having a virtual meeting. So thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we are meet, meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and the Tungurong Nation, as well as the Indigenous people of the lands you are joining from as well. The From the Ground Up project is funded by the Australian Government National Land Care Program, and we have three years remaining of this funding cycle. Today, we are hosting the first of a series of three virtual farm walk and talks, focusing on how to improve our farming landscapes or how to modify them to manage climate risks and what we need to do to morph or adapt or change to manage climate risks on our properties. These questions will form the basis of a question time after the, after the um, video presentation. So I'll just quickly go through it again. For those who have not used Microsoft Teams, if you move your mouse across the, the about two thirds down, there's a bar and there's all little icons on it. One's a video, one's a microphone, and there's a raise your hand button. I'll just press it now and you'll see that a little hand appears by my face um, and I turn it off and it lowers. Um, if you turn it on, we know that you'd like to ask a question. There's also a little conversation bubble um, next, next icon along. And if you press that, there'll be a meeting chat place and you can type a message to us or a question to us. If all else fails, um, feel free to use my email and I will have that on hand as well. Um, we are joined today by Damien Gerrans, whose property it is we're going to have a look at. So if you do have questions, please, um, to the farmer that himself, then by all means, feel free to either chat it or just say, turn your mic on and your video on so that we know who you are and then just say he hello and he'll answer that question for you. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and you'll see a movie come up and we'll watch the first of the video presentation. So please just hold tight. All right, here it is. Kirsty, we can't hear the sound. Okay, thanks, okay. Ash. I'll just pause it. Do you know how I can do that? We should have had a practice run of this bit. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a practice run. Sorry, everyone. Um, oh, hang on. I know. Hang on. My headphones, the computer. Sorry, everyone, please pause. There's always going to be problems. We still can't hear it, Kirsty. Okay. Thanks. Oh, shit. You don't know how I can do that, do you, Dal? Did I just did I just swear on that? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. 
um, I practice everything else but getting the video and the microphone going on that. Um, Ash? Yeah. I th Can you call in Aaron? Yeah. Thanks. We'll just have a pause there. I'll stop sharing my screen. So I'm getting a message to just try and help me. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, what I'll do is I'll just try and change my microphone on my computer setting. So it might just take me a bit to get that going and then we should be right. Do you want me to give a background to the property while we uh, Thanks, set up? Thanks, Damien. Cause... Thank you. So can you see me now? Yeah, I can, yes. Yeah. So... The, the, the property we're looking at today is in the Lionel East Valley, which is in behind Swanpool. We're about 10 k's out of Swanpool, so between Mansfield and Benalla, for, for those that aren't in the Golden Broken region. It's an old family farm. It was selected by the, the Evans family in the late 1880s, and uh, my mother-in-law is a descendant of the Evanses, so it's my mother-in-law and uh, my wife's aunt uh, family farm. And it's been um, primarily grazed uh, for beef cattle over the last uh, 40 years. And prior to that was a dairy when the cream run uh, used to take cream into the butter factory in Swanpool. So it's a uh, it's an old uh, dairy farm that's now used for, for grazing. And like many farms that have been in the family for a long time, and this one has been also been leased out for, for 35 years out of the last 40, a lot of the infrastructure is degraded and has been run down. So uh, my wife and I moved back to the farm about six years ago and, and lived here for a couple of years before taking on the lease. And then we took on the farm lease with the aim of, tr you know, trying to restore some of the infrastructure and some of the land. So in the video, you'll see, you know, a mix of um, new fences and, and some really old fences. Um, and we've also, taken advantage of grants and opportunities through the Golden Broken CMA to fence off waterways and from the, the Gecko Clan land care network to run trial sites. And that, that's been a really important way of, of kickstarting many of the, uh, the activities that we wanted to do to restore uh, the farm in both its you know, productive sense, but also in an ecological sense. So part of Part of what we've been trying to do is is to improve things as well as uh, have the farm pay, which it you know leased out at, at returns and income, but it hasn't always been the best for the infrastructure or the way that the farm has been run. Yeah, thanks, Damien. I think we've got an answer. Um, I've just had to call in the GBC May Tech person. So thanks, Aaron, if you're online. Ash, do you have any further? Yeah, so just when you go to share your screen, there should yep. be a little, um, before you select which screen, there's a little tick box saying share system audio. If you just click that in the left of that um, tray, well, that's the IT terminology. <laughs> So when I go to talk, do the virtual farm. So when you go share walk. screen. Oh, yep, share screen. Yep. Yep, it should be on the left of that, a little tick box saying share system audio. Uh, yep, got it. All right. Shall we try again? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, I will start this presentation again. See how we go.
So we just like to hear a little bit about the history of the property. Um, you know, what sort of enterprise do you have? How many acres? Where it sits in um, geological formations? Type of soil? That type of stuff. Yep. So uh, this is my wife's family farm. We're 350 acres on the edge of the Strathbogie Ranges at Lyme Reese. We've got a mix of um, hills and and creek flats uh, on the farm, and we've been running uh, beef cattle for the last uh, three years. So we're just running steers. And the type of soil? Um, I noticed there's a few hills around. What? Yeah. So um, as as a lot of the properties around the Strathbogies have, we've got quite large uh, granite outcrops on the mm -hmm. place, and that that sort of you know, led to granitic sand hills. So the hills uh, can set quite hard in summer and can get wet or spewy in winter. But then we've also got two creeks running through the farm and, and that's their old swamps that were hand dug to drain the creeks mm. or to drain the flats. And, and that's quite thick topsoil. So the sort of topsoil you'd, you'd want for growing veggies or, you know, it's really good soil down on the creeks. Yeah, so we've got a, right. got a range of profiles. Yeah, right. And um, you know we're here to understand a little bit more about how climate change is impacting um, farming systems. So could you tell us a little bit about whether you know anything about whether creeks are dried up or whether they keep going or what enterprises used to be on the farm and what things have changed? Yeah, so the, the farm was originally selected by my wife's family in the late 1800s. Yeah. And they... Uh, Start, you know, they used to run a range of things. They had spuds growing on the flats and there was a paddock called the carrot paddock, which yeah. was obviously used for carrots at some stage in the past. But their main enterprise was uh, dairy cattle and, and they ran that uh, for the cream. The cream went to the butter factory at Swan Pool. And then when the cream run stopped, uh, they got out of dairy and went to beef cattle. Um, my wife's uh, grandparents, when they were retiring, they leased the farm out to a family down the road and they ran it for about 35 years as a beef cattle farm. And my wife's grandfather kept a few sheep, uh, mainly for his own interest and, and for the shows and things like that as well. So um, for the last probably 40 years, it's been run as a beef cattle uh, property. Yeah, right. And um, you've got a couple of creeks running through your yeah. property. Um, have they always been running or what, what's the history behind that? Yeah, so prior to us moving here, we always heard that the creeks never stopped flowing or they'd only stopped once in 80 years. Yeah, right. Um, but for the last five years, the creeks have stopped every summer. And so we're, we're lucky one of them's quite reliable and the other's quite intermittent now. So a lot of what we've been doing is uh, diversifying our water supply. So one of the first projects uh, we implemented was a, a project with the Golden Broken CMA to fence off the waterways uh, and establish some off-stream water. So we've got a dam that we can pump to a header tank and then feed paddocks on troughs. Yeah, right. And so the water seems to be a big part of, you know, managing your farm into the future. And we've noticed that you've got some really interesting measuring systems mm. happening on the property. Tell us a little bit more about those. Yeah, so when uh, my wife and I first took on the lease, we uh, entered into a, a trial with the Gecko Clan to uh, try and improve our soil, uh, to up our soil moisture, improve the, the structure of the soil, up the soil carbon, and also to, um, to, I guess, better monitor our water usage. So the Gecko Clan funded um, a soil moisture probe and weather station, and we deep rip the paddock with the yeoman's plough. We'd set up a lot of our water systems on, on a key line style approach, so we're keen to see how that worked. And we trial planting tillage radish and oats to improve um, the soil structure, really. Mm -hmm. the, the the benefit of having the, the remote uh, weather station and soil, monitor, uh, soil moisture probes was that we could add to it. So the Gecko clan added uh, a flow meter, a tank monitor, uh -huh and a dam surface level monitor. And it could all use the telemetry from the weather station, you know, to, to value add to that. So you say remote, how does that work? So they've got a solar panel and battery systems and a, and a 3G uh, card, SIM card in them. So they ping back to a, um, to a, a support system every, every five minutes and, and record soil moisture, weather data, um, dam level and, and tank monitoring, you know, in that interval, 
and then I can log in remotely and, and see how things are tracking. But I can also set it up with alarms. So the tank, if a, a trough sort of blows out or a float comes off and all the water runs out, I get an alarm on my phone to tell me that. So it sounds like that was one of the main innovative practices that you've done on your property in terms of um, climate change. Is there anything else that you're looking at? Yeah, so the, the benefits of knowing our soil moisture and temperature, um, the, there's benefits in having that knowledge in terms of seeding paddocks. Yep. So I'm trialling an annual seed mix to um, improve pasture diversity and, and you know, um, improve the soil structure. Uh, so I read a book by Gabe Brown, who, who talked about using two seasons of annual um, seed mixes and, and diverse seed mixes. So one in one in autumn, one in spring, and then the following autumn you sow a perennial mix in. So because we have the soil moisture and temperature data, we can use that to time uh, when the seed goes in. Yeah. And we've been lucky this season that it's been, you know, such a great great autumn. So that data is not as important, but you know, in a drier, drier autumn or, you know, or where frosts are coming more frequently, you can use that data to better time the seeding. Right. And so you've got water, you're doing your seeding. Um, is there anything else that you're interested in um, making sure that happens on the property to prepare yourself for climate, you know, changes and yeah. uh, I suppose a drier climate? Yeah, so or a um, fluctuating climate, I suppose. Yeah, I think because that um, there's more unknowns with climate change, so we're trying to, you know, diversify our water supply, um, increase the resilience of our pastures, and, and I suppose the last thing we're doing is is increasing our, um, you know, our shelter belts and, and plant cover, so that we've got uh, better stock shelter. So the, the the farm used to have a lot of really good paddock trees, you know, it, it has um, longleaf box and yellow box and up in the hills, there's stringy bark and yeah. peppermints. But because of the way um, the farm's been grazed and managed, those trees haven't been replacing themselves. So we're, you know, each year we're planting more shelter belts to try and just increase that cover and protection through the farm. Um, I noticed as we've been walking around, you've got quite some young plantings around dams. Um, tell us why you're doing that. Yeah, so we're... The, the dams we put in for our off-stream water, we've, we've excluded stock from. Yep. So where we can tie those in with a shelter belt running through the farm, uh, we have. So we're, we're pretty careful about not planting near dam walls and, and not reducing the inflows to dams. But dams are, are fenced off, so it's another opportunity to, to you know, put some plantings in those and, and tie them in with part of a, you know, a, a broader revegetation plan. Sounds like you've done some um, great research and you're actually implementing it on your farm now. Um, so it, it's fantastic to be able to come out and see it, Damien. Thanks for coming. Um, thank you for that. Sorry about the technical issues just getting going. Um, it inevitably happens. Can everyone, can you hear me now, Ash? Loud and clear. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so the next next thought I had coming out of that was um, I'm really I'm you're, I'm really curious about what other people are doing in their um, in their plots or on their properties in relation to climate change. So I'd just like to begin this next part by saying it's open. Uh, for people to contribute. You can either do it via my email, via the chat box if it's working, or just um, say hello, turn your video on and your microphone and um, say hello to us. Um, if, if you're having trouble, please just email me and we can include you in that conversation and make sure your question's heard by everybody. So is there anything that people are currently doing on your property to help um, embed resilience or manage climate change and the fluctuations of weather, um, knowing that there's multiple tools out there? But, um, yeah, what, what are you doing that can add to the conversation and provide people with other, other tools? I 
can hear someone. Hi, Kirst. It's Sally Day here. Good on you, Sally. How are you? Uh, Good, good. I was just um, probably speaking on behalf of our land care group, which is on the other side of the hill. Um, yep. We've been following along the same lines as Damien and working really hard to try and replace paddock tree numbers um, yep. in the last few years. So we've had a lot of, we've lost a lot in recent sort of summer storms. Like I know a lot of these trees are getting to the end of their life, but the storm activity, the drought, um, ongoing yep. impacts from stock, so echoing Damien that it's really important to start looking at replacing those before you lose your oldest trees. And yeah. with the idea too that every new tree that you plant, you know, you're growing that shade in your paddock. It's also taking the grazing pressure off the really old trees that are still kicking along and doing okay. So yeah. there are really hollow rich trees um, because of their age. So losing them uh, is a really significant thing in our landscape. So even, you know, planting to grow your own shade um, for, for a productivity gain, but also planting to protect those those older trees in the landscape. It's really important. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, and thanks for contributing to that discussion. Um, so the question is, is there anything that you're currently doing on your own property to help you embed resilience or to manage for climate change? The other thing that you can do is if you want to ask Damien a question, he's online as well. I'll just wait another couple of minutes. Yes, so we've got uh, Tony Coyle and Nev. We'll go for Tony first. Tony, do you want to turn your microphone on for us? Yep. Yep. Um, no, I didn't ask any questions. So nothing. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to say something though, Tony? Um, no, not really. No. Okay. No worries. <laughs> well done for being brave and putting up your hand. No, I didn't do anything. Oh, okay. Um, so if you just press your little hand button, then that'll go down. Um, Nev, we've got a hand up for you. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, Nev. Uh, two things. We've had, we're in much the same. We're in Crichton's Creek, much the same kind of soil. Uh, have a lot of springs. Permanent Creek. When we bought the place 40 years ago, it said it's never stopped. It did in 82 uh, for a while and in 2002, but it hasn't stopped the last few years. Not running in our place. Uh, right. It does stop the down. But we've also got springs that overflow into this creek. Uh, two years ago, the, the dam that we used was getting low for the first time in 50 years. So we last summer put in a new dam in the spring, fenced it off, uh, put a solar panel and a tank up on the ridge and pump to that, which leads to about eight troughs all around the paddock. And then the overflow from that tank, it, we never switched the pump off, it goes to another dam that doesn't have a good attachment. So it's working well. It gave us unlimited water around the garden, never had to worry about starting a bloody petrol pump, which you've got no prep will it won't start or something like that uh also a question for damien does he have rabbits that's the trouble we have had here over the years and wombats in our creek is something shocking so i've never fenced the creek off it's very rocky so i don't think it needs fencing off because once you fence it off it's impossible to get in there that's it thank you thanks nev just put your hand down thank you damien yeah, so when, when we fenced off our creek, we set the fences quite a way back from the top of the bank. So instead of them being tight to the, the creek bank and, and only being big enough for the revegetation, we actually set them up as um, laneways through the farm. So they're, they're quite wide and we can access those uh, for, for pest and weed control. So the main, the main weeds we have here are, are blackberries and an occasional gorse bush that we can keep on top of. 
Uh, we haven't had um, an issue with rabbits for some time, um, but they're, you know, we keep on top of those and the numbers are low. And, and we definitely have lots of wombats. And um, yeah, we, we just slowly, slowly work away at that where we can. Uh, but my advice on fencing off waterways is to not think of it as lost land, but to use it as opportunities for for laneways and 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 get other benefits out of it. So ours will be fenced off for at least five years in terms of grazing grazing pressure on the trees. But then after that, I plan to use them for um, for laneway access for moving livestock, and and in that you know we can knock down grass once or twice a year as required. But if you've got easy access, then, then getting in there for pest control is not a problem. Thanks, Damien. Um, that that was a, a, an interesting take on it, so thank you. Christy, did you want to say something? Hi, yeah. Christy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, look, I just wanted to ask Damien a question as well. Um, yep. And you spoke about improving his soil. Just wanting to know what sort of soil improvement techniques he's used, um, whether that's incorporated um, sort of green manure um, cropping. Um, and also he mentioned a resource, a, a book that he'd referred to. I didn't quite catch it. But, uh, look, I was interested to know what role native perennials play in in that cropping system. Thanks. If Damien? Yeah, so um, um, calling us or calling our system a cropping system is probably um, pushing it further than than it, than it really is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, where we, I picked up an old conichet a couple of years ago to just try and increase pasture diversity. Um, the book I read, I don't know whether you can see that, but it's yes, called Dirt to Soil. Yep. Yeah. And it's by Gabe Brown is the author. I can put and that was, in the email, Damien, um, that I'm going to send out for evaluation so that everyone has it. Yeah, thank you. So I guess you know, when when we started the Gecko, crank, uh, Gecko Clan trial, um, it was mainly about dealing with soil structure, but um, Kerry Robson and, and Brad Coston uh, from AgVic, so Kerry from the Gecko Clan and, and Brad from AgVic came out and we they did a bit of a pasture survey to see what we had. And so the hills that we were having problems with, with hard setting soils and, and really wet in winter, had really low pasture diversity. We had um, a lot of, you know, annual grasses and cape weed and, you know, not much that was very good. So I looked at um, um, putting in perennial mixes. So I used a, a seed mix that came from Mansfield, it had uh, a perennial rye, some coxfoot, some subclovers, and a Monaro ryegrass. And it was really just about trying to add to that. So I picked up the cedar to add to it, add to what we had. Um, and then in the meantime, I read the book about from Gabe Brown that talked about using annual seed mixes, really diverse annual seed mixes as a way of priming the soil prior to putting in perennial mixes. So his advice was to do a an autumn planting and a spring planting of whatever you can get your hands on, you know, so if it's, um, you know, if it's radishes and oats and clovers and just be as diverse as you can. And then that, his argument is it primes the soil preparation for then a perennial mix. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of uh, work gone into using grazing intensity to increase uh, perennial pastures, and I'm playing around with that as well, just using hot tape to, to move cattle frequently. And now with it, we've got troughs and paddocks at a size, we can do that. Uh, I'm doing that also. Um, but we've also got some pastures where we've got really good kangaroo grass coming back because the grazing pressure's been, been let off a bit. And in those, I'm not I'm not ripping the soil. I'm not playing around with it. I'll just use that grazing intensity and and timing of grazing to allow those to continue to set seed. And and be, I guess it's, I'm still trialing lots of different things to see how to do that best. And are you managing so the weeds in amongst that um, with the grazing pressure as well, or are you spraying? Um, I. 
so I've, I've sprayed cape weed on parts of the farm, a, a, you know, a few times. So there was a, a grant in the Benalla Shire region that the Gecko Clan coordinated this year for herbicides. So I use that to buy some um, broadleaf spray for cape weed. Uh, my view on that's been that I'm happy to do that a couple of years in a row, but then if I don't change the seed bank that's available or the grazing regime, then I, I don't want to be doing it every year. So I want to change the way that, you know, that that happens here. So um, I haven't sprayed out silver grass. I haven't, you know, um, or, or other annual sort of grass weeds. I'm, I'm going to try and um, sort of up the perennials by grazing and seeding as a way about competing them where I can. And a lot of it here is about not grazing to the extent over summer that we had no ground cover and those annual weeds come up. So it's about changing the ground cover as well. Thanks, Thank Damien, you. for that. Christy, I might move on because there's a couple of other um, people got their hands up. Um, if you could just put your hand down, Christy. Yep, Joe Doolan. Damien, um, yeah, thank you, Damien, for sharing your story. I just wanted to, um, yeah, congratulate you on your grazing and everything and what you're doing with your paddocks and, um, and yes, that book by Dave Brown is just. Um, we're down in Kyabram on the flatlands, so I don't have the mountains and granitic soils that you guys have. Uh, we're organic dairy, so we've been um, playing with our grazing management for a while, and then obviously it's different. Our cattle move twice a day, every day, but we've found um, the last couple of years, we've been really looking at our, uh, obviously keeping ground cover is our main um, thing, growing plants, having growing plants, live plants in the soil at all times, which is a Gay Brown thing as well. Um, but after this last two years, but yeah, the dry summer, when we got the summer rains this January, February, um, yeah, we hadn't irrigated this summer because the water was too expensive. So we had our cows on hay and foliage, which they were really happy and healthy and fine with that. When it rained, we were just thrilled with the rapid response of our pastures. They just jumped out of the ground and um, yeah, really diverse species mixed in there as well. We had chicory, plantain, clovers, um, some ryegrass, but yeah, lucerne, um, lots of stuff in there. And yeah, that was our, we were just wrapped with what we've been doing over the last few years. So we've been here for 10 years and um, obviously not doing that all the time, but probably the last five, six years we've been really looking at that diversity. And yeah, I applaud you on what you're doing in this place, Damien, because um, yeah, the results, all of a sudden it just ticks and um, have done a bit of work with Colin Sice as well, who's another really good resource. Um, he's the pasture grazing guy, um, pasture cropping guy, I mean, sorry. Um, but yeah, I sort of rang him and told him about what we saw in our paddocks and he said, you know, all of a sudden you start to see the changes and your species, grasses will come into your paddocks that you, you didn't actually sow. So I think Christy asked about the native perennials. Uh, we had native millet popping up this year. We didn't sow it. <laughs> so we were thrilled. Like with the summer rains, it was just seemed to be the right conditions for it. So um, yeah, keep up the great work. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That sounds like you've been on an interesting journey as well. And I know um, that Joe is working also with the Golden Murray Land Care Network, who are running a holistic management course later in this year. So if you're interested, just let me know and I'll follow that up. Um, I know we've sort of um, pushed over time um, and I'm OK with that because I, I didn't manage to trial the the, the sound before we started so sorry about that um if there's any other questions i'm really happy for people to stay on the line but the other thought that i had was um was there anything in damien's journey that's encouraged you to think or try something new um and if so what are you interested in and what sort of help do you need to get going on that One of the hardest things about running these webinars is sitting here in, in quietness looking at a screen. So um, 
I appreciate that it's quite um, daunting sometimes to be asked those questions and I'm not sure whether you can answer or not. Um, what we might do, it's it sounds like most people are pretty happy with um, where we're at. I just want to thank you for participating today, Damien. Thank you so much for coming along and a first um, running the video on your property and then secondly coming and joining the meeting. I think that was really valuable. Um, Ash, thank you so much for helping out with all those technical difficulties at the start. And I'm going to send you an email now with the book that Damien answered, but also a, just an evaluation. I know this is not like getting out in the paddock, um, but we'd really appreciate some, it's only seven, seven questions, seven short questions that would take you a couple of minutes. Um, so please fill that out now before you hop off your computer so that we can um, make sure we take down those responses. Should you wish to stay on and just have a conversation with us for the next five minutes or so afterwards, then um, do that, please do that. Uh, otherwise, if you push your red um, hang up button on that bar, then that will mean that you will um, leave the conversation. So thank you.